In this roundup of the week, punch-ups are breaking out left, right and centre. Well, mostly left, between climate scientist Michael Mann and activist Naomi Klein. And then separately, a backlash against the letter produced with 11,000 scientists as people raise the question how far should scientists extend their scope to include public policy pronouncements. Plus, Extinction Rebellion has a really good week, and yet they're still not completely happy about it. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. There's been a bruising exchange on Twitter this week between climate scientist Michael Mann and activist Naomi Klein. It all kicked off because Mann had a review published of Klein's latest book, On Fire, in the journal Nature. It was actually published in September, but only burst into a flame all of its own this week. In the review, Michael Mann takes issue with one aspect of Klein's book while wrapping his words in almost obsequious respect and reverence. For example, he says things like, I don't always recommend a book I disagree with, but when I do, it's usually by Naomi Klein. Which is a compliment there, up front. He goes on to say that she's inspired a generation and in this book she, quote, provides a lucid and compelling case for the Green New Deal. Well, so far so good. If I was promoting a book, I'd be happy to have that sort of recommendation on the cover. And he goes on for three long paragraphs of praise and then adds this paragraph. I share her concern over each of these societal afflictions, but I wonder at the assertion that it's not possible to address climate change without solving all that plagues us. My worry is this. Saddling a climate movement with a laundry list of other social programmes risks alienating needed supporters, say independents and moderate conservatives, who are apprehensive about a broader agenda of progressive social change. And this, of course, goes to the heart of some of the criticisms of a Green New Deal, that it throws in every cause that the left cares about into one monster initiative and ties it all to climate change. So in raising the concern, it's not as though man isn't voicing something that others haven't already debated. However, for some people, these are just wrong opinions, and wrong opinions are not to be tolerated. So friends and supporters of Klein suddenly launched an attack criticising nature for publishing the review. Natalie Molina Nino said, Dear Nature, we're done reading the mansplaining trash from myopic white bros who do not speak for those on the front lines. Michael Mann has been and continues to be problematic and dated. Publishing his mediocrity isn't a good look. Ooh, the full fury of leftist intersectionality right there. Dr. Jane Zelikova tweeted this, Bleh! Nature gives a platform to a mansplainer who reviews Naomi Klein's books and unoriginally says we should focus on climate and not on the other societal ills. An anti-Green New Deal take that is as pale, stale and male as he is. When certain people kicked back on the use of the term mansplainer in this context, Naomi Klein herself chimed in. In the review, Mann explains to me that climate is not the only driver of migration. Here is what I wrote on page 49. The drivers of mass migration are complex, war, gang violence, sexual violence, deepening poverty. What is clear is that climate disruption is intensifying all of these. In that, she seemed more to be adding her approval to the term mansplaining than going to the heart of the point of his review. But she then went on to add... I respect Michael Mann as a scientist and appreciate his courage, but he overtly states it's advisable to decouple economic justice and environmental issues. That is an argument against climate justice and it's divisive. I'm surprised more people haven't challenged him on it. And finally, she says this. I didn't respond to his misrepresentation of my work for six weeks for that reason, but it would have been nice if other people in the movement had engaged with the extremely dangerous idea that we can pry justice apart from climate action. Allies shouldn't get that kind of pass. Meteorologist Eric Holthouse then pitched in with this. Ladies, does he use the phrase communicated to the public? constantly promote his own work, even when women are more qualified, leverage his platform to write op-eds in prominent magazines disparaging the Green New Deal? He's not your climate hero. He's a gatekeeper. Michael Mann retweeted Nino's tweet with the question, do climate champions really think this sort of stuff is helpful? He then added, this space has become incredibly toxic, in part due to the behaviour of a few high-profile bad actors, and in part due to the fact that the denial delay machine is fanning these flames. Happily, they're laughing about it, actually. 
What followed all this was a barrage, hundreds of tweets, some outraged social justice warriors supporting Klein, saying how toxic it was for someone like Michael Mann to stick his nose into the discussion, many others coming to Mann's support, reacting against the racism and sexism and dismissing his opinion because he happens to be of the wrong gender and skin colour, and pointing to his immensely respectful review and his long history of fighting the cause of climate change. So here's my quick take. This is exactly why, in my view, it's so dangerous that the issue of climate change is currently in the sole possession of the left in the US. It's not the case elsewhere. In the UK general election, parties on all sides, save for the Brexit party, are agreed on the principle of significant action on climate change, leaving scope for useful arguments about the details. In the UK, we have the political right committed to net zero carbon by 2050, with the left arguing it could be done by 2030. That's a different sort of debate. But in America, it's just on one side. And Michael Mann is absolutely right to worry that the Green New Deal, by building in every item from the radical left wish list, makes the whole issue of climate change potentially much less attractive to moderate America, if such a thing even still exists. Of course, doing so absolutely serves the left's purposes. It wants the issue to become impossible to separate from their political positioning, because although it might benefit the world if it became a cross-party consensus issue, it wouldn't benefit them. Because so long as they have exclusive ownership of the issue, they think they can bring in the support of all those young people who care about it. But the obvious problem is that the left is currently in the process of eating itself with the toxic outcomes from its approach to intersectionality, the idea that which groups you belong to are more important than what you have to say and who you are. And that's right there in this whole row. Man's arguments aren't engaged, but he's dismissed for being the wrong gender and the wrong colour. Most of his supporters focused on how incredibly respectful his review had been of Klein's book. But really, that wasn't the point. I mean, frankly, he could have hated it and said so. So long as he attacked the ideas rather than her personally, so what? Ideas are ideas. They're up for free debate. And that's how, hopefully, you get to better ideas. When you have positions based on slogans that are held to be beyond discussion, then you have a recipe for failure with unintended consequences. The fawning nature of Michael Mann's review came across as someone who has a very irritable partner. And they're desperately trying to frame a mild criticism with the most flattery as possible so as not to set them off. But then it sets them off anyway. These are important issues. You know, or they aren't. And we get to freely debate ideas even if you don't like it. One of the most interesting sides of this were certain people on Klein's side who said that man might know his stuff as a scientist, but what he was commenting on was policy and so outside his expertise, so he should shut up. For instance, Dr. Jane Zelikova again, there is a whole body of work on the socio-economic dimensions of addressing large societal challenges, and he does not have that scholarship, but feels entitled to critique anyway. This question of who's allowed to speak on what is at the essence of some of that toxic intersectional left discussion, at least in that last example, because when it comes to public policy, everyone's allowed an opinion. Everyone. Suggesting that lumping lots of issues together in the Green New Deal is the wrong approach, that is not an argument reserved only for scholars. Otherwise, why not end this whole thing about ordinary people voting? I mean, why not just hand it over to a panel of experts? What could possibly go wrong? And it's not as though Michael Mann was using an argument from authority to suggest that climate scientists were uniquely qualified. He just expressed his opinion. White, male, climate scientists are allowed to express opinions on books, even if they're not ingratiatingly respectful, and on public policy measures, even if they don't agree with yours. But it's interesting to note, because in the same week we had another initiative that focused attention on climate change. And this also had a very big public policy element, but in a very different context. We had a letter signed by 11,000 sensible people telling us about all the things we need to do to avert a crisis. Now, I got into all sorts of trouble in the YouTube comment section by suggesting that this was basically equivalent to the recent letter from 500 other sensible people on the other side that was sent to the UN. But really, they did have a lot more in common than not. 
It was reported as all these scientists have looked at our situation and are sounding the alarm. But it really wasn't. I mean, it was another move in the PR battle where one side or the other argues from authority, saying, look at the big number of our experts. I'm not averse to the fact that people need to fight PR battles to win their argument. Don't get me wrong. Both sides are fighting the good fight in the public battle of ideas, and that's where these things should be fought. But this wasn't a report with new data, as it was implied. These 11,000 people were not 11,000 climate scientists who'd been looking into the detail of the things that were in the letter. Someone drafted a mostly polemical letter drawing on a few indicators of previously known information they wanted to highlight, and they got a bunch of people to sign it to show their support for the basic principles. Nothing wrong with that. But people who were jumping up and down as though this was further evidence that we're entering the end of days, and they just need to calm down. The lead author of the letter was William Ripple, a professor of ecology known for research on the role of the grey wolf and being a supporter of Extinction Rebellion. Which is fine, it's what you'd expect, because with all complete respect, this is a campaigning document, not a research document. He uses some of the more apocalyptic rhetoric, talking about circumstances where the world will be made uninhabitable, although this isn't defined and it isn't linked to any referenced research to support it. It goes into some very specific policy areas, while missing out huge numbers of others. So, talking about how we need to be eating less meat. And about the need for a carbon tax of over $15.25. Although it's not obvious where they got that figure from, because it's not the one used by the IPCC. So why those policies? And, and why policies at all? Why not just tell the governments how much the carbon has to come down, which is the bit where the scientific expertise comes in, and let them work out how they want to get there? But of course, campaigners have their favoured issues and their favoured political perspectives. Take this paragraph. Our goals need to shift from GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems and improving human well-being by prioritising basic needs and reducing inequality. When people say that environmentalists are basically pushing socialism, it's paragraphs like that that they cite. Every society wants more affluence for its members. It's that pursuit that's brought absolute poverty down by half over the last couple of decades. We need to do it in a way that produces net zero carbon. Communist countries said that they improved lives by prioritising basic needs and reducing inequality. They ended up with starving people and reduced inequality only because almost everyone except for the party elites were equally poor. Climate scientists have as much right as anyone else to vote for the politics they want. As with Michael Mann, everyone has their opinion. But it serves us better if they keep the politics separate from the actual science. This theme was taken up by a number of professionals on Twitter. Arvind Ravikumar said this, You know what frustrates me? Folks who work on climate science making sweeping policy suggestions stroke statements as though it's just an obvious extension of their research. A. Policy analysis is very different from science. B. Please don't be flippant about the work that we do. Dr Kate Marvel agreed. Asking climate scientists about climate policy is like asking a plumber to build a house. You definitely need them involved, but you're probably going to need more expertise than that. And that's all absolutely correct, of course. Being an expert in atmospheric physics doesn't make you a policy expert. Presenting a document signed by scientists with policy recommendations that go into some quite contentious areas goes beyond the brief. There's nothing in the challenge we have about the quantity of greenhouse gases that we have in the troposphere that inherently says socialism. Now, maybe societies will decide that's the route they want to take. Maybe. But I'm betting we'd expect to debate that and vote for it, not have it handed to us as though the science demanded it. It's the sort of thing that arguably brings the science into disrepute. Of course, the reporting of this document didn't reflect the limited nature of it, even with the BBC. A global group of around 11,000 scientists have endorsed research that says the world is facing a climate emergency. While many of those weren't actual scientists, they may have a degree. Molly Scott Cato's on that list. She's a former academic who looked at how the green economy served the interests of social justice, cooperatives and social enterprises. She's now a member of the European Parliament for the Green Party. She is a perfectly fine person, 
but she's a politician, she's not a scientist in the terms that's being suggested in this sort of headline. And of course there are lots of others in a similar vein. All good people, but not necessarily what we'd think of as scientists. Also, this is not research, it's polemic, backed with a relatively small number of citations to extremely mainstream data points. It's not a study, it's opinion. Some of the most serious claims, threats of human extinction, are vaguely worded and not supported by citations or the IPCC reports. So no, not a contribution that should be fueling even more fear and anxiety than we already have to contend with. Now in the UK, Extinction Rebellion should be happy this week since they've won their court case against the London Metropolitan Police which means that it was not lawful for the Met to ban their protests in London in the closing days of Extinction Rebellion two-week action in October. You'll recall that the group had set up camp in Trafalgar Square and was using that as the jumping-off point to go to different parts of the capital to carry out various illegal protests, like trying to blockade London City Airport and to jam the roads around Westminster. After about 10 days of that, the police had had enough, and they used a 1986 law introduced under Margaret Thatcher to ban Extinction Rebellion gathering in London for the remainder of the fortnight. And that, of course, got people very self-righteous, arguing that it's our absolute right to peacefully protest, which of course it is, or it should be. But you know, when you're constantly and consistently running off and breaking the law with the stated intent of stretching police resources to breaking point, it's not actually the same as peacefully protesting. And since you said that the whole point was getting people arrested, why would you whine about it when the police make it easier for you to get arrested? However, that argument obviously didn't hold swaying the High Court and it was ruled that the Met had acted outside its powers. Section 14 of the Public Order Act, which enables the police to ban demonstrations if they think it will create serious public disorder, serious damage to property or serious disruption to life of a community, or if it's believed the organisers of that assembly will intimidate or compel others to do unlawful acts. Now clearly you'd say that the Extinction Rebellion action fulfilled the requirements under that description. However, the Act permits the police to specify the location, duration and number of participants of an assembly, but the Met went beyond that and defined the whole of London to be covered by their ban which was held to be therefore covering multiple locations and Extinction Rebellion successfully argued that because of its decentralised nature, lots of the different actions taken in its name were carried out by individual groups and therefore these were multiple assemblies. And Section 14 could not be used as a blanket ban to prevent anyone taking action in their name. What this means for future isn't totally clear. It does seem that the Met could still use Section 14 in the future for specific locations, not just as a blanket ban across London, which may come to be relevant fairly soon because Extinction Rebellion has promised a series of actions leading up to the election date on the 12th of December. And there are certainly calls from a number of quarters for the police to be given powers that specifically enable them to deal more effectively with this sort of action, where a group aims to get people arrested to stretch police resources. It's not obvious what that sort of legal power would look like. Needless to say, those who were arrested under Section 14 are now contemplated suing the Met for wrongful arrest. Because that's what people do. Incidentally, it is worth noting this. On a campaign strategy point, when you get a movement that uses law-breaking as a standard tactic, you do see quite a lot where the energy of the movement gets diverted into the local battles that, cre that it creates with the mechanisms of law enforcement, rather than continuing to focus on the actual campaign objectives. In my misspent youth in the peace movement, you would see campaigners who went to prison, starting new campaigns in protest at prison conditions and fighting on technicalities of the law exactly like this one and they saw it all as fighting the good fight but of course while they were doing that they weren't fighting the actual campaign it was supposed to be in the name of. It's the equivalent of campaigning with attention deficit disorder where every time you see something bright and sparkly in front of you you go chasing after it. Early indications are to their credit and you should know that I rarely give them a huge amount of credit Extinction Rebellion are aware of that trap and are not falling into it. They said that they won't pursue a class action against the Met, although individuals can obviously do what they want. 
And right now, you might think that Extinction Rebellion loyalists would probably be saying, come on, Malin, our campaign's working. After all, we now have a Citizens' Assembly being formed to look at climate change. And that's Extinction Rebellion demand number three right there. And it's true. Six of the cross-party parliamentary committees banded together to create the Citizens' Assembly. So it's not the government, although I dare say the government will be deferential to what comes back from it. Invitations have gone out to 3,000 people to join the Assembly, not because it'll be that big, because they expect lots of people will say no. The brief for the Assembly is to look at how the UK will reach zero emissions climate target and what can be done by members of the public to help reduce carbon emissions. As you may recall, I did a video saying that citizens' assemblies were XR's worst idea. So you may be assuming I would be actively opposing this new move. Well, I don't. And the reason I don't is the same reason why the real XR ideologues, the Rupert Reeds, for instance, are just not very happy about this. If you watch that video, you'll remember I pointed out that XR's vision for Citizens' Assembly wasn't as a consultative body, but a group that usurped the power of Parliament. That government would be obligated to carry out whatever they came back with. And they'd be consulting the body on how to get to zero emissions by 2025, not 2050. Because when you have an idea so impossible that you yourself can't explain how it would be done, then obviously getting a bunch of randomly selected people together will come up with brilliant ideas that nobody else has ever thought of. And of course, XR would want to ensure that the experts that they heard from were all the ones that they would select who would support their radical vision of wartime mobilisation scale decisions. Now, that would not be a citizens' assembly like any we've seen before. Really, it's just a way of grabbing power while seeming to be ultra democratic about it. Well, that's not what's happening. It's a consultative body. The government has a Committee on Climate Change technical report detailing how it can get to net zero by 2050. Such a complex and technical programme was consulted with experts in their field, not randomly selected people off the street because they wouldn't know how to do those things. But they are going to ask them, what could individuals like them do? Because that is the perspective that they bring. It's an appropriate question. Does that mean that I'm a fan of this particular vision of the initiative? Well, it would be easy to say yes and to give all the platitudes about how important it will be to hear all the views of ordinary people and so on and so on. I am not quite there. I'm neutral. I think there are better ways to do what it's setting out to do than selecting a bunch of people to sit around in a big committee meeting and discuss it. The citizens' assemblies there have been before were OK for getting to grips with certain types of issues, but a big, complex, multi-layered issue like this, I'm not convinced this format is going to be effective. But it's a big experiment, and we'll find out. I'm definitely a fan of getting more data to inform our opinions about it all, so we'll see how it's run and how well it works. If it comes back with more than just a few token ideas that everyone can nod and say, oh yes, that's a worthy thing we could all do, then yeah, it'll be interesting. Extinction Rebellion's Rupert Reed has already complained about it having the wrong remit, and they will complain, because effectively this initiative shoots their goose. The technical difference between this version and theirs will not be of much interest to anyone outside their own group. And even half of their own people won't really understand why the founders were so fixated on this in the form that they wanted it. So if it fails to deliver the golden egg, it won't have much power anymore as a third demand. Any more than the Liberal Democrats had leverage on proportional representation once there'd been a referendum on one version of PR. The fact there might have been better versions of PR that more people might have supported ceased to be relevant because no one was going to support a second go. Oh, and the other celebration for the XR crowd in the last week came because the UK government has ended fracking. Effectively for good, although there's a token loophole in there somewhere. It's one of those issues people get very excited about. Personally, I don't care about it one way or the other. In the period when we're working to decarbonise the energy supply, we're still going to be using a percentage of fossil fuels. Obvious and unavoidable. Whether those fossil fuels come from natural gas or gas derived from fracking, it's a point of detail I personally couldn't care less about. Most of the campaigners just basically go for what is most in their eye line. So fossil fuels are coming into stream all the time, but they can see some of them, but not others. And that will determine what they protest about. 
And it's a perfectly good thing to decide to ban it within that context. I mean, from what I've read about it, the UK restrictions on how large an earth tremor had to be before you had to stop and reevaluate, it was set a lot lower than it is in the United States. And that was probably just being overly cautious in the face of a sceptical public opinion. But at the end of the day, no community is going to welcome having fracking happening in their immediate vicinity, literally causing the earth to move. And I'm not going to say that I blame them for that. If it was fracking gas or coal, it'd be worth pushing ahead. But it's not. So it becomes one of those symbolic victories for the campaigners. Doesn't actually practically change anything globally, which is what the climate campaigners should care about. But it does make the local campaigners happy. And why not? At the same time, of course, what's really hacked a few people off is the proposal to open a new coal mine in Wales. The new coal supply is aimed at steel production and concrete production, not electricity generation. And this kind of highlights one of our outstanding tricky problems. We can replace fossil fuels for home energy and for ground transport and for agriculture, but at the moment not for steel and cement production. Energy intensive processes needing very high temperatures. And yes, in the short term, that's why we need a small quantity of coal and why some element of the net zero plan includes carbon capture technologies. Because for the foreseeable future, there are some things that will create emissions that we need. So in the short term, we need to cover them in other ways. The campaigners will probably protest and try to prevent it because it's a thing they hate and they protest for things that they hate. Arguably, it would actually be more effective to hold the government to account for delivering the things that it's promised to do in the short term because there's no guarantee that those things will get done if nobody's paying attention. That's it for this week. No time for anything that I like or dislike. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Mm -hmm.